Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, uh, Stephen Peinecker. And folks, we have a familiar face uh, to probably about 90% of my audience. This man needs no introduction. Of course, previous guest uh, of my program, as well as uh, been on Mormon Stories and Gospel Tangents, John Hamer. Welcome back to the program. Stephen, I'm so happy to be back. I'm so happy also uh, how your channel's been growing and uh, all of the great content you've putting out, been putting out. Thank you. And you know, it's so funny. One of the things I really appreciate about you is that, you know, you came, you agreed to come on early on when I was just kind of getting started. And I'll always remember the Matt Harris's and the Christopher Thomas's and the Sandra Tanner's and, and yeah. the John Hamer's and, and the Richard Bushman's. It was amazing. Yeah. Richard Bushman. How He's, he's an enormously um, generous individual who uh, is, is, um, Definitely, you know, you, you know, you meet him at a conference, he's ready to talk to you and so on. And absolutely. so anyway, yeah, salt the earth. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just just a great guy. So it's been a real adventure. It's been really fun. And you know, I was I've been wanting to get you back on the program. And so I was trying to think of different things we do. And I thought, you know, why don't we do like a, a chronological history of the first like four decades of the church. So what we're going to do is we're planning this is the game plan is we're going to do uh, three parts. And we're going to cover the periods from basically roughly 1820 to 1831 or 1830, and then 1830 to 1844, and, and then up to 1860. So all those are yeah. touchstones. We all know what those dates represent. <laughs> and so we thought we would do like an hour, hour and a half segment on each one of these decades. It's going to be kind of open. We're not going to be like following a strict outline. We're just going to find, follow a general chronology and just kind of have a conversation. So I'm excited about this. I think this is going to be a really cool uh, thing. So John, um, Let's just start things off with a young farm boy who has this encounter <laughs> in the in in the grove. Yeah. Um. So the way that almost everybody in the restoration tells the restoration story at this point is to start off with the first vision story. Um. We should point out that 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 is a a modern uh, way of of framing the whole story and narrative. So when my ancestors joined the movement um, in 1832, they would have been totally unaware of this story. The story was not what drew them into the um, restoration. And if they were told about Joseph Smith's first vision, they would assume that somebody was talking about the first time he had an experience with the angel Moroni, right? And so, so this is something, a story is not to say that the story um, wasn't uh, important and that, or that there's no, you know, like or the, the stories uh, made up later or something like that, but rather it was important to Joseph Smith as opposed to, um, you know, let's say the whole movement when the movement got started. When the movement got started, it was really, really the excitement was, you know, new scripture, right? The Book of Mormon and so on. And that's what drew people. Missionaries were going around. Uh, they were talking about uh, new um new revelation the heavens are not closed um they're talking about all of the ways that the different sectarian christian controversies uh, were finding resolution through ancient prophets in the americas a way to write the americas into uh the biblical story that was the exciting and you know invigorating thing that got the whole thing rolling but for Joseph Smith foundationally you know later the story is told and retold and told many many times um, uh, it is goes back to himself for a spiritual experience um, that is understood and told in the restoration tradition uh, in a very particular way. Uh, it's told from usually recounting uh, one of the last uh, and mo most um, last iterations that Joseph had of it, late a uh, late Nauvoo telling. It was published in the Times and Seasons and was later canonized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints scripture, The Pearl of Great Price. People sometimes ask, okay, well, why did, why did, why did Community of Christ reject the Pearl of Great Price? Well, the Pearl of Great Price was a, was a pamphlet that the Utah Mormon Church published many decades after it split apart from Community of Christ. So it's not something that was um, part of our canon of scripture in the early restored church. It's something that's distinctive of the Utah LDS Church. But in any event, that became that version of the story became canonized. And as a jumping off point from that, um, uh, the LDS Church has, let's say, continuously made artwork that very much um, 
literalizes it, you know, and makes it a much more, you know, it's definitely a visitation, I'm sorry, a vision, first vision, and yet it's presented as a visitation. If you go into the LDS Church History Museum on Temple Square, you go into kind of a little, it's almost like a little tiny IMAX theater of surround sound of this experience. And it's, um, it's almost like you've walked into the Lord of the Rings in terms of the special effects of this vision, visitation experience you're having. Um, but if we, um, so unfortunately, the late version as it's told is actually includes all kinds of anachronistic details that um, are, are what happens with memory. So as you tell something that's vitally important to you and you, you change over time and you become a much older person, and every time you retell it, the way memory works, your memory is overwritten and you have a new way of happening it. And so, and so the way the story is told in the end and is canonized in the LDS church is, um, is inclusive of how Joseph Smith is thinking as, a, as an adult leader in Nauvoo, having been a leader of a denomination and so on, having, having come to new theological uh, speculation uh, and then recapturing this important spiritual experiences, re recasting it and re-remembering it in light of that new, new way. Um, but we do have, fortunately, anyway, earlier versions of the of the telling of it. And uh, for your from your background, Stephen, you know, um, it's something that is enormously familiar, I think, to anybody who's a evangelical, because um, at its heart and at the and, and the actual um, tradition, if we were to uncover what probably actually happened, would be very very familiar as a born again experience um, uh, to an evangelical. Yes, and actually, you know, uh, Dan Vogel even brings this out as that he had what we would call a born again experience in the context of that period of time, which we have uh, the Methodists and the Baptists and the various uh, revivals of some time, uh, of some happening. This is what we call the second great, great awakening period. And we do have uh, actually within our evangelical world, uh, we have a uh, people who had similar experiences with Jesus or with angels, the divine, um, yeah, yeah. even Grove-like experiences. So this is actually was very common. This was uh, it, part of the world that Joseph grew up in. And so, and then of course, as somebody from the born again tradition, um, I think that, you know, Joseph Smith being born again to me is, is significant as well. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, so for example, if you read uh, Mark Shearer's uh, three volume, um, history of the community of Christ, the journey of a people. Um, he, he takes several of those um, evangelical, those born again experiences that are happening in second grade awakening, New York state, just like Joseph Smith, exact contemporaries describing almost exactly the same thing as, as the, um, as his first vision experience. And so one of the things that um, is always surprising to people is that, you know, they think of this thing that seems now so alien and so uh, unique but when you actually go back and examine the context, it turns out that it's often quite in keeping with the context of its time. Um, and so just to, for people who then are not as familiar with uh, the general Second Great Awakening, Burn Again experience and so forth, the theology um, of that time that had uh, that began in those kind of revivals, that revival preaching, this hellfire and brimstone uh, kind of preaching. You're up on the, uh, you have a, you know, you get a big stage, you're, you gather all the people, they don't have churches because it's out on the frontier. They, uh, you know, hundreds of people, uh, you know, more people than usually people, country folk will have seen. They get together into this amazing social experience. The preachers are up there, um, you know, they don't have a prepared talk. They're just talking from the spirit, from the Bible and, and so on for hours at a time, yelling and, and, and all this kind of thing. But part of the it's we, we think of it now when we think of that hellfire and brimstone stuff we think of it as being just kind of like like i don't know like vicious and people like uh you know a preacher who's trying to condemn you and, and for you know like they're really anti-sex and all the whatever kind of you know negative uh bitter heart that they have or something like that in fact the the theology that they had of it was that they felt that it was absolutely essential that a person feel deeply inside them themselves convicted of their own sins their own individual human mortal helplessness in the face of, of sin, and the need, therefore, to have a, a life-changing spiritual experience where they sense the Spirit, they sense Christ, and they, and they sense Christ um, forgiving them of their sins 
and 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 like I say, like you say, be, what's called being born again, born anew in the spirit at that moment. And the, and they, and literally, people when they feel convicted of their sins, they fall on the ground. <laughs> and when they and when they have that experience, they're lifted up, and that ha- and that's literally happening in addition to. Um, and in addition to the feelings that are happening. And that's described like crazy in the Book of Mormon. The, the King Benjamin revi- uh, sermon in the Book of Mormon, it's so set in the ancient times, but it is could have been Palmyra, you know, you know, in the, the experience of Joseph Smith. It's exactly what happens to all the people and they all are, are on the ground and they're lifted up and they had that born again experience. And so, and so this experience that Joseph Smith has, he even describes it often associated with the revival. He fe- and, the, and the earliest version of the, of the experience that we have, he kind of explains that he, he feels therefore convicted of his sins. He goes uh, to the woods, he prays, and, and um, in that sense of despair, you know, he has a, a vision and a sense of you know, experience of Christ who then says, your sins are forgiven you, go and sin no more. And so that's probably the closest we get to the actual let's say the actual spiritual experience that he would have had, which as you've pointed out is therefore quite in keeping with the kinds of spiritual experiences that people have had throughout history, certainly in that time and even to the present. And, you know, I talk to people and I tell them, I tell them that, and this is kind of uh, off topic a bit, but I just want to say the perspective of me looking at Joseph Smith, that if he in, indeed had a born again experience in 1820, it actually better explains everything uh, as, better than if he was a car con man or a charlatan uh yeah. to me everything makes much more sense in the context of joseph smith being well a born again christian and and so i think that's why I, I like to key in on that because first of all it's language that's familiar to me and john i have to say i just love hearing you describe a 19th century revival man and then hearing you <laughs> talking and you describing because i'm like oh, i've been to that service man <laughs> and, and 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 it's really important folks that you know one of the things i really like to, to key in on too is and, and i want to continue this conversation and maybe throw in you know stuff that uh, is that how so the people that started the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints back then of course within the church of christ were all what we would call born-again christians and i want to talk about later on as we talk about the formation of the church but that's part of the reason why i'm fascinated with this time is because this is a very familiar world that just joseph yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So the same, the traditions are kind of coming out of the same exact beginning, yeah. you know, um, and they just evolve in different ways. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, it's, um, I don't know. I, I it, it's, in, what's interesting to me is that, you know, this, it, it's the context is not, we don't have to go looking for any of this because the context is also right th- all through the Book of Mormon, yeah. you know? And so I actually think um, the earliest account of the first vision is, is actually written in the Book of Mormon because um, my understanding of um, the Book of Mormon is that it's that Joseph Smith is the author and that um, and he is composing uh, uh, what he understands to be um, a true record, but that this is not being coming word for word translation from any ancient text and this is not something that existed in history and none of the characters are historical characters, rather, um, um, Joseph is channeling it. We'll talk about the spiritual gifts and his understanding of channeling and 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 seer, what a seer means and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but in any event, one of the things that happens when a when a writer inspired or otherwise is writing their first text, lots of things are drawn from their own life and experience in, invariably. And uh, so the people have talked about how uh, Nephi and is so much, you know, a, a Joseph Smith kind of stand in as an autobiographical sort of uh, novel with his older brothers and younger brothers and father dream who has the same visions as his own father and so forth. And so what happens is in the book of Enos, which is one of the little books of the Book of Mormon at the beginning of the Book of Enos. Um, uh, he goes and set the, the character of Enos, I'll read it here just for a second, <laughs> if I can, he, um, he says, uh, I will tell you of the wrestle which I had before God before I received a remission of my sins. So this exact thing that happens in a boring experience. I went to hunt beasts in the forest and the words which I'd often heard my father speak concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep in my heart and my soul hungered. And I kneeled down before my maker and I cried unto the might unto him in a mighty prayer and supplication for mine own soul. And all day long I did cry unto him and yea, 
Um, when the night came, I did still raise my voice high and that it reached the heavens. And there a voice came unto me saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee and thou shalt be blessed. And I Enos knew that God could not lie, wherefore my guilt was swept away. Mm. And so anyway, so I think, you know, that's written actually earlier than any vision, I'm sorry, any uh, description that we have of the first vision. And I think it actually um, probably, I mean, he wasn't hunting. <laughs> you know, in other words, but, but in, in, in Enos is older or whatever. But anyway, I, I think it's a, it's an interesting um, potential uh, inspired by Joseph's own experience kind of a story. So, and then, so we have parallel worlds here. So we have the uh, born again Christian world. And then we also have a world that is steeped in what we could call a magical worldview. Yes. Um, and so maybe let's talk about that world as well that parallels the, the Christian world. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, uh, so one thing I'll say, you know, so, um, you know, Richard Bushman, bless him. <laughs> you know, he, in Rough Stone Rolling, in talking about all of the folk magic, um, he did something that uh, it was very difficult for um, historians who are in good standing with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to do. You know, so when um, back in the 80s, uh, Michael Quinn wrote Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview and so on, um, you know, th this was a, th a thing that led to him being, um, uh, you know, fired from his uh, tenured position at BYU as a history professor and so on. And uh, when I was a graduate student at BYU, um, um, my uh, historiography professor, Bill Hamblin, uh, for whom I was a, uh, a teaching assistant, um, uh, research assistant, actually, uh, he taught um, a historiography class where he, um, he had us read early Mormonism and the magic world so that he could uh, snarkily you know, undercut it and laugh at it and all these kind of things. In other words, so it was a source of derision at BYU and so on. Uh, 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 but now largely it's accepted that all of these, uh, uh, this background, this folk magic background is totally um, uh, historically justified and the evidence is kind of conclusively shows it all. And and Richard Bushman included that in his book that would, and, and therefore was a very source of a lot of trial for many um, believing members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who had been shielded from true history uh, by a church that didn't publish it in its manuals um, and actually published uh, the opposite, <laughs> you know, and so they weren't had to have exposure to it. Um, but that said, he also does a thing where he cordons it off. And so, so somehow for him, folk magic is a preface that Joseph Smith is doing at one point that maybe prepared him for being a real prophet. But actually the chronology is entirely met, muddy and mixed. So, you know, the things that are happening, first visions first, but really all of the experience, the Moni experience, all of the experience with the plates is totally interspersed uh, with Joseph Smith's experience with folk magic and being a, a treasure seer, as opposed to being what he later calls, thinks of as a religious seer, he doesn't say religious, but being a true seer. And so those are totally overlapping with each other. And in fact, what he's doing to be a treasure seer is identical, I think, to what he's doing to be a, um, uh, a religious seer. So tell me, what is a treasure seer? What, what is that officer role? What, what was he doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so for us, um, we also, when we're thinking about folk magic and what we now kind of broadly consider to be spiritualism, um, we are inevitably, um, we have a prism um, on the other side of which, we're on the other side of the age of, spirit, of spiritualism. So in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century, spiritualism became an international fad. And so now we, now we think of seances and we think of crystal balls and Ouija boards and all of those kind of things. Um, and those became popularized in a kind of a crazy way. And now we think of it even in a different way than happened before. But, but it actually had roots in folk magic practices. And so even, so the idea of, um, the idea of being able to use like a crystal ball as a way to um, channel uh, vision, spirit, visions with your spiritual eyes, so in other words, not your physical eyes, this is things you're having a visionary experience, but using a something, a crystal or something like that, crystal ball or stone, any number of things as a focus uh, for that kind of a vision. That's something that goes back 
you know, pre into prehistory, but certainly in the West um, through the whole medieval tradition of, uh, and so on. And so, um, so in Joseph Smith's immediate environment, um, they were calling kind of like a special stone that has a spiritual resonance for um, an individual. They were calling that either a seer stone or a peep stone, something like that. And so what, what the idea of it is, is that um, um, you would have such a stone, you would be, if you were had a gift as being a, a seer, uh, and you had a stone that you found that was specially attuned to you. This is kind of how magic works. You have to actually, magic involves like paganism involves like lots of rituals, you know? So there is not, um, it's, it's, uh, it's way less, I don't know, just about prayer and spiritual stuff the way Christianity is. And it's more, and it's way more about, um, you know, you know, you think of making like potions and stuff like that, right? And so in other words, there's way more active ingredients and things like that that have to be done uh, because, um, as opposed to traditional, like Christianity, where where everything is just receiving God's grace and blessings, this is actually a, magicians actually are doing stuff, right? And so it's more it's way more works based than grace based. So anyway, you're doing a lot of works, and so and so you um, you you find the stone that's a, that's um, that's attuned to you through kind of a bunch of different ways that you have to go through rituals to have it. The harder it is to get, the more powerful it probably is, and so on, uh, makes your story more potent. In the case of Joseph Smith, the way they do it, he puts it in the, into his hat in order to, uh, and puts his head in his hat in order to, to get all the, all the natural light to be gone. So he doesn't want to have any kind of natural light there so that then his, with his spiritual, his physical eyes essentially is probably open because it's black, but essentially so they can't see anymore. Then his spiritual eyes are open, looking into the, into the stone, and then they're seeing different things that are channeled, right? And so, um, you know, these are everything from finding your lost keys <laughs> to, uh, in this case of why I'm calling it a treasure seer, finding where buried treasure is is located somewhere around in the neighborhood, and and how they can dig it up and get it so that they can, you know, have, you know, they can have money, frankly, <laughs> you know. So yeah, and so and this was, uh, you know, I just want to say a couple things, you know, I. A lot of people might like if you're like a traditional Orthodox uh, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, you probably don't like hearing some of this stuff. But I just want to kind of liken it onto my grandfather, who was raised in the prairies of Western Canada, as, as so it was the frontier. A um, hundred years after Joseph Smith, but it was a very similar world, yeah. and uh, they they were recruited. They they sent the the Canadian government went down to Chicago to recruit Dutchmen to come and do some farming out in Canada. Well, my grandfather um, was steeped in um, this worldview as well. They uh, yeah. used dowsing rods. As a matter of fact, he had a, a later when he yeah. moved back to the States, he used dowsing rods as he, he, he drilled for water and they used dowsing rods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I yeah. tell people, I said, in the 1950s, I could look at my grandpa's old calendars that they used to give out to people and it had all astro astrological symbols in them, right? Yeah. Now, today, if you get a calendar for my family's, uh, plumbing supply place. It's going to have Bible verses. It's not going to have astrology in there. Now. <laughs> but my point being is, is that yeah. these worlds are intertwined and they were intertwined in the evangelical Christian world until very recently as well. And so oh, yeah. I think as evangelicals, when they're really critical, they need to step back and realize that there were many people, especially rural, rural folk, oh, that yeah. embraced a lot of the magical worldview that Joseph Smith lived in as well. Well, so we have to be aware also that, um, we living in an era where uh, the promises of, of of modern scientific medicine have actually borne out finally. Uh, that doesn't mean that people still don't have conspiracies and not believe in vaccines or whatever. You know, I don't want to I don't want to ca cause controversy here. But anyway, not everybody believes in 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 uh, modern medicine and everything like that. But it at least exists and works. The it that did not that's not true in the early 19th century, right? And so. And so you're just as Joseph Smith actually had a really crazy as a child, a really crazy encounter with um, the leading uh, physicians at Dartmouth <laughs> College, Dartmouth University, who performed experimental surgery on him that was so advanced and it, and it really worked on his leg and everything like that, that it's hard to even believe that that was happening. But in any event, that's like a very early proto example of when modern medicine was actually just emerging and and actually accomplishing anything. In general, you um, um, Western medicine had been based on on uh, humoralism, 
which is a kind of an old uh, Aristotelian, like ancient Greek uh, notion. It's, it's essentially the same as traditional Chinese medicine, which is to say something that is a system that people like and they kind of believe in, but actually has no, no actual basis. Um, and so it's, uh, and so you're just as likely getting care makes people better often, <laughs> you know, in other words, but, but you're also, um, so humoralism includes, let's say, if you're too sanguine, one of your humors is you've got, you've got too much blood. Well, so then one of the ways that you, you treat being sanguine is by bloodletting, right? And so there are occasions actually where leeches actually are still used in at work, but actually a lot of the times it's not a good thing to do, you know? And so, and so anyway, the point of it is, is that um, because there was, so the medicine itself and the doctors themselves were only so good and they were also just as likely to kill you, um, there were also folk practitioner, practitioners. So there's the old lady in the village who, you know, ha, you know, is able to give the herbs to you, you know, if you, if you need this and that, you know, you're not being able to have kids, well, then do this and this thing or whatever, you know, in other words, the, diff, the traditional things that people want, everything from, I want this, I want this girl to fall in love with me, <laughs> you know, to, um, I want to curse this guy I ate, you know, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? In other words, so all of those things have existed and there's been a market for that, especially like you say, in rural areas, you know, for the thousand, for actually forever throughout human history. And it was all very current and it's still somewhat, there's still things that are current, but anyway, like you say, we can at least remember some of it. you mentioned dowsing rods. So my, my, uh, my grandmother, my mother's mother, who is a uh, very devout, uh, a member of the Utah church. Um, she um, was an avid genealogist. So doing genealogy was the most important thing in her entire life. And so all she wanted to do was go to cemeteries. And when she'd go to cemeteries, she'd get a dowsing rod and she'd actually douse for ancestors. You know, so the dance, if you ever wonder around cemeteries, it is really hard to find gravestones. And so anyway, she would use dowsing rods to find them. So <laughs> wow. That is so fascinating to me. You know, I just, uh, since we're a book review channel and it's Mormon book reviews, I just want to point out, here's a really good yeah. book that deals uh, The Refiner's Fire, The Making of Mormon Cosmology from 1644 to 1844. That's by John L. Brooke. It's not as well known as the Magic Worldview book that um, Michael Quinn wrote, but this is a good resource if those want to understand that world. And also just a little fun, uh, I just recently taped a, a, a book review of Mark Elwood's uh, The Glass Looker, Oh, a graphic yeah. novel, um, which kind of illustrates some of the folklore and the stories. Not all of them are true. Some of them are just the stories and myths that grew up about them, but it kind of gives you like a visual aid of the world, the magic worldview that he grew up in. So I would just, those, if those are two resources I'd recommend to the audience to maybe check out to get an idea of, of that world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great resources. Yeah, so, the Refiner's Fire is better in terms of also giving you the, um, let's say the context in general of magic going all the way back you know, within uh, Anglo-American culture and so forth. Yeah. So basically, Joseph, I mean, he is a young man. He starts getting people pay him to look for buried treasure and those kind of yes. things. And this is happening like in the early 1820s. So this is post first vision. And then yes. um, as he's doing this, he also has an encounter in his right. bedroom um, with his siblings were there with him. Uh, it was a very closed area. Um, a lot of people look at the paintings and they think it was just him in his bed and that's a kind of myth, a mythology. Um, and in the middle of the night, he has this, uh, this visitation. Maybe we could talk about that. Well, again, I would say vision. Okay. Vision. So I don't, I would not say vi visitation. I'd say there are no visitations. That's not a thing. That's okay. And that's, and I'm glad you cleared that up. I, um, I, one thing I want to say is before we actually talk about, um, this experience he has yeah. is some people wonder, was it Moroni or was it Nephi that appeared to him? Maybe we could talk a little bit about that as well. So, so because people and paint make paintings of a visitation and movies and so forth, um, then you think this, of this as being a very um, literalistic and physical experience as opposed to a spiritual visionary experience and so um and when the, when it's a very literal and visceral physical experience or whatever then then you attach um as you know let's say a a very a person particularly to this because suddenly there is a alien that has appeared you know you know or transported into the into your bedroom and so forth um but when you're having something that is um a spiritual experience when you're responding to inspiration or something like that um this is this is much more 
ethereal. There is less, it, 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 and so it first probably, probably as this was in, initially experienced, there's probably no name attached to this experience at all. So the, um, um, in, in Joseph Smith's father's account of this story, um, as retold by one of his neighbors, um, which I think is referenced in the glass liquor. The glass liquor is so good for some of these early sources. Uh, it's certainly in, in um, uh, uh, Dan Vogel's five volumes of the early Mormon documents that have all of these accounts. Anyway, he's, ref he's it's referred to as like an old spirit, you know, so this old spirit uh, that is um, the more or less like the, uh, when they were on the other kinds, when they were on treasure seeking, and then they understand that there is um, an ancient treasure that the in ancient inhabitants of the land have buried uh, in this area, and the and the and the group of money diggers are going there for purely secular reasons to dig it up so that they can get a treasure. Um, they nevertheless uh, understand that they not only know where the treasure is because of the treasure seer who is 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 identifying where it is the treasure seer is also identifying that there is a guardian spirit that is protecting the treasure so essentially the spirit of presumably one of the ancient inhabitants who um died there or you know it's just like whether you have a pirate they, you, they kill one of the pirates over the when they bury the treasure so that the that pirate spirit guards the treasure or whatever against people from stealing it and so forth so there's a tr spirit of uh, that's a guardian spirit for the treasure and specifically the way they understood that in the tre treasure digging component of it the um uh the the spirit has to be propitiated through different or or bound through different kinds of magical things so you've got to draw the right kind of magical circle around it you got to do the right kind of thing and if anybody does the wrong thing if you were if you know you had if you talked at the wrong moment or whatever then the whole enchantment's going to be broken and the spirit is actually going to pull the treasure deeper into the earth it'll become slippery and this very and and as much as people who maybe let's say are traditional LDS and who are hearing this are like, oh, I don't, this is crazy stuff that Joseph Smith was not doing that kind of thing. Well, he was doing that kind of thing. And it's even written into the Book of Mormon. So there, the Book of Mormon itself talks about um, how the, the treasures that they all buried, uh, that the Nephites and so on buried, they couldn't find them again because they'd become slippery, which is to say that the had been pulled deeper into the earth and so on, and they couldn't be found anymore. And so they understand it that way. And so initially what's happening here is with totally within the context of what Joseph Smith has already been experiencing when he has been being acting as a seer and being made aware that there are treasures in various places and that and they're trying to dig for them. For example, that's when he met Emma is going to go and boarding it at her house, her father's house. Uh, when the dig money digging company was, you know, nearby, they were trying to dig for one of these treasures. So same kind of thing here. There is a um, an experience that he has with uh, a spirit that is the guardian of a treasure, but this treasure is not just a just just a treasure that you're going to get secularly to make you rich. <laughs> this is a treasure that uh, is a um, that has a religious significance that is going to um, ha promises to do two things, the first of which is to um, uh, help and redeem the Native American people who um, are in a just a terrible state as a result of uh, uh, colonialism and the imperialism that has uh, genocide that's devastated uh, them to this kind of point. And it's within this biblical context that um, redemption means for them to become Christian. That would not, that is not what you'd understand from a native's own perspective in this kind of a thing, but it is the, from the perspective of someone within that biblical worldview that Joseph Smith was in of, the, of a born again Christian. Um, uh, and so redeeming them so that they can be, uh, they can reclaim their birthright as a chosen people of God, children, beloved children of God, and, and know their own history that's been lost. And then two, um, to end to end the turmoil of Protestant sectarianism that's just rife in his own family and his own community, and so and so this is I think the promise. I don't know if it's initially, I don't know if there's initially he gets that those are two the two components that this is going to do. By the time the book is composed, those are the two things that it's that it's for. Um, but in any event, there is a um, a promise here of a treasure that is not simply you getting rich. This is rather this is something that's making the world that you're living in a better place for, you know, two very critical religious reasons for Americans on the, 
on the frontier in the, you know, or in, in colonial America anyway. You know, and it's, uh, you know, and again, folks, I'm just talking as an outsider and, you know, sometimes I put my, my skeptic hat on, sometimes I put my Christian hat on and, I, and, and then religious bent and stuff, you know, and like, okay, supernatural, natural, and all these, and these are all kind of different, different worldviews. The story that we have of golden plates with a history written on them is right. a truly unique story within this context, right? I mean, now we know there's influences of, well, well, I know, I know a view of the Hebrews, we talk about where he found like a yellow parchment, right? So like, right, in that kind of sense. But, well, and, you but, but know, to, to, and tie in, to tie in the idea of a treasure, as well as with this religious significance, um, that's kind of unique. And of course, we could talk about Grant Palmer's book where he tries to tie it in with uh, uh, another similar story uh, with the lost civilization of Atlantis and records and stuff like that, that he was following perhaps that pattern. I just think, I just think it's really a fascinating thing that's going on now. You had mentioned there were other uh, examples perhaps that you would like to bring up of, of people having similar uh, maybe experiences or, or, or what, what have you on that regard? Well, so the unique part of it here is that, yes, that it's attached here to a religious experience, it, right? And so that's the unique part. And the unique part is going to be using um, kind of folk magic, you, you know, a, a kind of a religious magic that evolves out of folk magic, using this gift of a, being a seer to channel the text, that's going to be, I think, unique. Uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of settler Americans in this time period, plus or minus 100 years, um, wanting to find yeah. artifacts uh, that they dig up uh, and, and or they say they dug up uh, that include that or that tell the, the history of the natives and that imply that there's a that the natives are attached in some way to the biblical worldview that goes back to Genesis. That is actually not unique at all. And no. there is a lot of that. Yeah. And so I mean a famous, we you know famous example is Solomon Spaulding, of course, you know, because that Solomon Spaulding in the 19th century people, and even some people to this day incorrectly imagine is the source of the uh, of the Book of Mormon. Um, but then there is a bunch of others of these that are just not well known. There's this um, uh, this text called the Wallam Olam. Um, where a guy, um, uh, I, I, I didn't look it up to remember the name and everything like that, but anyway, this guy who actually either knew a little bit of Lenape or Delaware, um, he actually um, wrote out a text, he translated it into Delaware, he translated it back from Delaware into English and included like uh, pictograms or picture stories or whatever and created this uh, creation story for the Delaware. And it was only I don't know, it's only in the later 20th century that this was exposed as a, as a, a hoax. You know, in other words, that is not, in other words, and lots of people who in Lenape, you know, still consider this to be, you know, their story and things like that. And that's just an ex example of a successful one. There's the, uh, the Michigan artifacts. So when people went around and they were digging in Indian mounds and they were pulling out these slate tablets, they were examining these at BYU as of the 1970s or something like that. Um, and anybody, it seems like anybody could have, with just the, the most casual examination of one of these things, you know, when you look at them, they're like, oh my goodness, here's a, here's kind of a ancient Indian looking ish artifact of the, the Noah's Ark or something like that. There's animals going on on a square boat and so on. Um, but um, if you just pay a little bit of attention to it, it turns out that the slate that these are actually uh, carved into is industrial slate that is uh, the scraps from chalkboards that are being made in the 19th century. And so obviously this is not, <laughs> you know, an ancient text, you know, and, you know, there's everything like that to the, um, there's actually many more of these that are about mm -hmm. the natives, but then there's even things like, you know, I grew up in Minnesota. So the Kensington runestone, this, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and in other words, so people like to make these things. <laughs> And, and so they're not as uncommon as you'd imagine. So the Book of Mormon is by far and away the most successful in the sense of it not being an actual native artifact and, or there's no native artifact involved and it's not native history, um, but it's not unique in any sense, <laughs> except for yeah. those, you know, the spirit, the, the treasure seer sense. Yeah, I, and, and thanks for kind of giving us uh, that because that, that is the world, of course. And you know, what's fast? Well, I don't want to actually get into the content of the Book of Mormon quite yet. I mean, we were kind of hinting towards yeah. it, but I, Kind of want to just talk a little bit more about this period of time where um, he has this um, encounter. Um, yes. He's told about these uh, ancient records, uh, and, then, and so he then starts um, telling a few people. I know Alvin was real enthusiastic uh, about this whole uh, endeavor. 
Um, right. And but also we're still, this is still the period of time where he's had the first vision. He's now had this um, encounter um, about the place, but he's also parallel still involved in the treasure seeking uh, business. Um, maybe talk a little bit about this. This uh, Now we've, we've added on another thing to this. We, we have treasure digging, but now we have somebody who has claimed that he's has access or will be granted access to these records. So how does that change any trajectory in the story, as you could see how that impacts the, the situation? Yeah, yeah, so so, so I know that we, so like I said, in, in Bushman's book, these two things are so cordoned off. In other words, treasure's ear, then religious ear. And in fact, it's totally overlapping. And I don't think that they are, any, any one of them is thinking of, of um, like the stuff that they're doing that is that we would label as folk magic as being any different from the rest of their totally composite worldview of being Christians, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and so I think that they would have just, they are seeing what they're doing as just kind of part of their worldview. And in some cases they are doing something that's more religious <laughs> and some things they're doing something that maybe doesn't have as, as much of a religious um, uh, component or, or, or motivation to it. Um, but yeah, it's totally inter um, interspersed, and it's interspersed in part because the um, announcing his uh, uh, his the information that he's got the from the old spirit that eventually come to be known as Moroni. In other words, we fixed on that name. Sometimes in some tellings of it, it was Nephi. Um, and that's why there's confusion, you know, as to what even the spirit's name was. It's ultimately what we now think of as the angel Moroni. Um, but uh, so we'll just say that for now. <laughs> you know, so so this Moroni experience. So because there's because there's multiple years from when he is first uh, announces that um, that he's had this experience with Moroni to when he announces that he now has gotten the plates. And part of that is because. Um, again, from this, I mentioned like to, in even like acquiring the seer stone, you have to um, go through certain kinds of rituals and things like that when you're doing things that are like folk magic in order to actually achieve the result. And that was certainly true for the Mungandi digging too. And so, and so as a result of that, um, you, he, you know, the, in order to acquire the plates, he was told he had to go through certain things and do certain rituals, things that are effectively magic. So you go to on a very magic night, the the autumnal equinox, you have to go to the, the place where the spirit has told you that they're, they're buried, you have to um, have done the right thing ahead of time, you have to have uh, bring the right person with you. And if you once in the case where you've been actually even shown and you dig and you actually see them, uh, if you if you do the wrong thing and you kind of walk away, then suddenly they're back magically back in the box and you can't, you know, you can't access it, the box lid won't open. In other words, the same kind of um, uh, uh, issues that you would have with, um, you know, like an actual, you know, the, the treasure searing is actually also the context of this religious treasure. So, hmm. yeah. And so, yeah. So, you know, actually, before we started, uh, you showed me a chart. Um, maybe yeah. we could just pop oh, yeah. that up on the screen and, and kind of talk about this parallel bit too. Here we go. Uh, okay. Um, let's give one second. Nothing's come up yet, but uh, you'll get it, I'm sure. There we go. There? All right, awesome. There we go. Yeah, it's starting to come out. Yeah, okay. So, okay. so let's just maybe talk a little bit about this chart and um, the parallels. So yeah, this is uh, just making a timeline here just to kind of, I just did the thumbnail timeline here to kind of uh, show the overlap. So if we just start here at the left in the spring of 1820, the dating exactly of when the first vision is, is open to question the different, everybody between Quinn and Vogel and so on, they have different times, but let's just say just for 1820, you know, Joseph has what's later remembered as the first vision, same time, spring of 1820, he leads a money digging company in Palmyra in 1822, he finds his brown seer stone while digging at the Chase's house in 1823. Joseph Smith has a vision of the spirit who shows him the location of the gold plates. He visits them every time, every year annually, but he can't obtain them. So he goes, like I say, on that, so it's September 22, so in other words, that autumnal equinox, this very special magic day, uh, you know, the, the equinoxes and the solstices have, have um, you know, folk magic significance. 
that's why Christmas is where it is and so forth, Easter. Um, anyway, the, uh, so that's 1823. Um, so then I'm, I mark here one, two, three, four, five. Those are the different equinoxes where you go back and try to obtain the plates, right? So every year. So after kind of failing on the third year, Joseph Sr. and Jr. are money digging and boarding with the Hales in Harmony. So that's where he's encountering Emma. March of 1826, this is this famous glass looker trial. So um, Joseph Smith is in uh, lower upstate New York and South Bainbridge where he's been money digging uh, and uh, is arrested for it on the, on the vagrant law. Uh, so you're not allowed to be a spurious person who is, you know, doing um, juggling or doing, uh, you know, the three card Monty and, and so on. And so his, uh, um, his, his patrons' sons think that their father's getting ripped off, so they take him to court. Um, uh, he's he's uh, brought before the court, and and his patron actually says, "No, no, no! It's not it's not a uh, it's not a hoax because he's a real seer, you know." And so he's, he actually gets convicted of doing because you can't be a real seer, and in according to the law, it's still illegal, right? And so he gets convicted, and he takes leg bail, which is to say, he, they, you know, they as long as these disreputable people who will leave the county, they don't care. So he goes away. So that's a, a court case that happened um, uh, in fall of 26. Uh, Joseph Jr. and Samuel Lawrence are seeking treasure again back in harmony. Um, and he uh, marries in the meanwhile, then he also marries, then elopes with Emma, uh, eventually uh, goes back to uh, her parents. He, in 1827, he promises Isaac Hale that he's going to give up the stone gazing and the money digging and actually settle down and they, they get a little house and he's going to set him up as a farmer and so on. Um, but then soon thereafter, in September of this kind of the fifth of these um, equinox, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, equinoxes, he says that he's obtained the plates. And so then beginning then at the end of that year in 1827, he begins this dictation of what becomes the lost 116 pages, the book of Lehi. Very fascinating. I like uh, what you did with this chart. I think it's important folks that, you know, um, whether you're a member of the church or you're an outsider, um, I think this is a useful because it, you know, there have been attempts throughout history to decouple uh, Joseph from um, this, this uh, from the magical aspect. And we can yeah. see that it is intertwined. And uh, now, folks, we can, you know, and this might be bothersome to some folks, but this is kind of what the historical record tells us. Maybe uh, jump out of the uh, the chart real yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah. And and one of the things I want to kind of talk about, since we're in this period of time, you know, uh, a lot of people were uh, very skeptical of the idea that Joseph would have been a treasure digger. And maybe we, we talked a little bit about it. I talked a little bit about it with my interview with uh, Dan Vogel. And that was that we didn't really know 100%. We, it wasn't until a Protestant minister went through the, the court records that he actually found the transcripts of the trial itself. Yeah. So maybe right. as just talk about how the response is, because you now Hugh Nibley said, and like in the 1950s and 60s says, if, if this cannot have happened, if this, this is ridiculous, there, there wasn't, it wasn't true. And if it turned out to be true, it undermined the whole enterprise in one sense. Yeah. So maybe just talk about maybe uh, the trial and then also maybe the the acceptance by scholars that this is something that, that he was a treasure digger, uh, that at least the scholarly consensus is that that he that he was. Yeah, so Hugh Nibley, um, you know, is a smart and funny guy, um, but he was also and he also set the tone for a lot of Utah Mormon apologetics. Um, but his uh, his two or three tactics. Um, are you know which set a kind of a, a bad foundation we're not in particularly intellectually honest and so um in some cases you know like uh he would very much uh snarkily um attack and you know antagonists so he you know in the in the phase in the wake of von brody's quite for its time excellent biography of joseph smith uh, no man knows my history he wrote a a, a sarcastic pamphlet uh no, ma'am, that's not history. You, know, you little, little lady, you know, you know, what ladies think they can write history, you know, this kind of sexist, sarcastic, snarky uh, thing. Uh, that, that's sort of the tone for the for farms, you know. So I mentioned Bill Hamlin, Dan Peterson. These are the these are the heirs of that that tradition. Uh, it's been damaging to the to because it's rooted in 
you know, bad, it's not, not Christian, <laughs> you know, it's rooted in, in, in being antagonistic and, and, and then the other part of it is uh, intellectual dishonesty. So, um, so Hugh Nibley loved to, uh, you know, the whole kind of, uh, you can't see the forest for the bark kind of details. <laughs> Uh, you know, so he just goes through and cover you with all kinds of irrelevant, stupid details and so on and things like that. That's a big tactic and uh, that has become central to the bad kind of Mormon apologetics. And then and then um, and then and then he even admitted occasionally, you know, just lying, you know, <laughs> so where, you know, if it doesn't make it, he does. No, but I appreciate that it was a he may, he may well have thought it might it was possible. But if it, if it came out and he got evidence that this was going to undermine the whole church, that doesn't usually haven't hasn't ever proved to be true so all of the different things that people predict you know they, they've said well if it was ever proved that all of the things that all of the egyptologists said about the book of abraham in the 1920s which are 100 percent spot on in other words it was it was like a the worldwide global scholarship you know because of the um catholic bishop i think or maybe maybe episcopalian bishop of 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 salt lake you know gathered all of this uh uh, scholarly consensus internationally uh, on the book of Abraham. It's 100% spot on. Those guys were 100% right, and it's all been proved. Um, and, you know, but people were saying, oh, if this could be proved, uh, this would destroy the church. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, all of these things, if it could be proved that Joseph Smith was marrying, marrying other man's wives or marrying 14 year olds or whatever. So if, if effectively it's all been proved. And so has it destroyed the church? I, you know, no. So, so, but in any event, this was a delaying tactic uh, uh, and it was not intellectually honest and it wasn't, um, uh, this kind of apologetics. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So eventually the evidence came out, the trial exists. This was definitely something that happened. The, um, uh, in the old days, in terms of the apologetics, uh, before people were actual historians who were doing the debating, um, Hugh Nibley, you know, in a lot of cases should know better as an actually academically trained person, but anyway, the, uh, but a lot of people who were just doing this are not trained academics. And so it was very possible all the way up through the middle of the 20th century to simply dismiss all sources that are hostile to you. Well, those are just uh, antagonists of the, uh, to the work. Those are people who are inspired by the devil. Literally, that's what people would say. So, so, so then therefore you are not looking at the actual sources. Once the sources have been compiled, uh, like as I'm, Dan Vogel is the one who did it, right? So once you have like that five volume source and you look at all of the, the different contexts, all of the different places, all of the reminiscences, the, the, the positive ones. In other words, the people who are trying their best to, like, uh, like in the trial with uh, um, whatever his name is, it's Knight, Knight, Joseph Knight, is that who is his patron? Anyway, so it, it, whoever it is who's saying it, he's saying, no, he's a real seer, you know? And so, you know, in other words, so there's, this, you know, like it's Joseph Smith's mom who's saying, you know, you know, we weren't, we weren't spending all of our time casting spells and following after the uh, ab abrac or whatever, you know, it, when he, it's, it's all of, you know, the, you know, Joseph's own talismans. It's all of the magic that Stephen described in the Book of Mormon. So, so you have all of the, um, the positive evidence, you also have all of the evidence that, uh, um, anyway, that it's not like there's not one world big conspiracy theory, right? So it's not like every, you know, so there's, so there's multiple perspectives and it all comes together. So the evidence is overwhelming. This was happening. So, and, and the Mormon church, by the way, the LDS church admits that because they, they have the seer stone, they show the seer stone, they have the, they have in kind of hidden away on their website somewhere, the discussions where they try to explain away the folk magic for uh, for their members. And, you know, and like, like I mentioned, um, uh, very uh, historians in good standing, like Richard Bushman, you know, are just very upfront about it. So now it just reminds me of my interview I did with Sandra Tanner, in which what I tried to do was document the period of when they had left the LDS church, but were baptized into a restorationist branch based in Missouri. It was right. Pauline Hancock, was that her name? Pauline Hancock's basement church. Yes. One and, of the most interesting of the Hedrickite tradition churches in the, in the restoration, the first, I think the first of all of the restoration churches to be led by a woman yeah. uh, and was, was very influential, I think, in, in the way that the Tanners actually ended up going and certainly um, being interested in and focused on history and the documents and all those kind of things. So it's just a neat, neat expression of the restoration. And it is. It's fascinating. And I, I'm glad that I interviewed her on it because yeah. Nobody really has asked her. Evangelicals don't want to hear about this part, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, wait, well, you became a born again Christian in a in a restoration church? No, that's not. That's a very uncomfortable, you know, narrative. Yeah. But one of the things that um, what we talk about was how that church, when they when they finally 
it was made public about yeah. the transcript of the a trial that this particular church had kind of had these conversations where they decided that they were no longer going to because all they basically they believed in the bible and the book of mormon and jesus yep yeah and and so and they didn't have the priesthood or didn't believe in the priesthood they just had those basic ideas and this church actually abandoned their belief in the Book of Mormon as a result of this. That's the only group within the Restoration that did that, as far as I know. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not aware of another one that's done that. Maybe some other small group has decided, well, we're done with that. But, yeah. but yeah, in this case, certainly not, for, <clears throat> certainly from a, I'm sure it's the only one that's gone from, from an, uh, from, let's say, an academic perspective. <laughs> so, you know, so there might have been ones that have kind of on a right, you know, wing direction have decided to, that they're done with it and gone some other way. But in general, I, they're the only one who's given it up because of, uh, you know, we've now got proof. We think that it's not what we thought it was. Yeah. So just check out that interview. It's an interesting story. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and of course, I love the Tanners. They're, Gerald was a yeah. genius and I wish I could have met the man. Um, so uh, we're still in the uh, 1820s here. And, and uh, uh, we, we've talked about the, the, the trial and you know, one of the things that his father had said that I wish that he would use this gift for uh, religious or spiritual means as opposed for, uh, you know, for gain, for financial gain. I right. think that's interesting because that's kind of like the turning point, right? Right there. It's almost like now he's turning in a different direction. You know, we're, again, we're just speaking from an academic sense. I know this is an issue of faith yeah. as well. Yeah. But as the narrative goes, this is the turning point where it is now going to a full-fledged religious uh, uh, direction. Yeah, yeah. So I think, so I think that there's enough evidence in all of this to believe that Joseph Smith believed that he had a spiritual gift. In other words, that he had the gift of being a seer, and that's even described what a seer is in in the Book of Mormon and so forth. Uh, it's a special gift, and um, and there's also also like early doctrine and what becomes doctrine and covenants, early early uh, uh, inspired documents where God. Uh, where Joseph Smith is channeling God's voice and is saying things like, you know, he's been given, <clears throat> given this gift and he should pretend to no other gift or something like that. And then, and then, and then that's later edited to be like, you know, you should pretend to no other gift until the work of the translation is finished and so on, you know what I mean? And so, but in, in any event, it does, the implication of it does seem like, um, <coughs> excuse me, that he has like a testimony of this gift of being a seer and like you say, his dad and maybe even his mom, I mean, then probably ultimately him, uh, there's a, a sense that if you've got a gift like this, um, uh, you know, just finding needles in haystacks is not actually making, you know, good use of it. It's, you know, you could, you, if you read, if you, you're um, uh, Clark Kent and you're living off in Smallville, uh, you know, use, you being, using your Superman powers in order to, uh, you know, be more efficient at the, at the, at the local plant, <laughs> you know what I mean? Never, never. That's not. You could have been doing more things with it by going to Metropolis. And so, so in this case, he's um, he repurposes it in the course of that chronology. As we kind of see, there's a change in the focus from what they had been doing, going around treasure digging and so forth, to a um, a using of the of the gift to channel this history, this history that's meant to. Um, a sacred story, what we might say, a scripture, this work of this component of scripture, extension of the Bible that has been lost to the natives and therefore has kept the natives from, from knowing, um, you know, their, their place as children of God, if, as far as the people in the settler biblical worldview would understand. So let's kind of just now, maybe now we know the narrative, of course, he, he finally gets the plates. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about we had, we had talked about it earlier that there was a there was a pretty popular idea within the, this world, especially within Protestant Christianity, that the mound builders were perhaps the lost ten tribes of Israel. Um, there's this you know there, there are people think finding things that they think are Hebrew uh, oriented or they're you know right. doing comparing and contrasting with Indian rituals and Jewish rituals. They're just trying to find like you know uh, this lost tribe, these lost tribes. Now you know a lot of the people who um, our apologists for the church will say that, you know, Joseph um, didn't go that direction. He chose to go, if we're, if we're talking about him being the author, he chose to go and talk about an unknown person, an unknown story, an unknown tribe, and, and tell their story. Um, so it's a fascinating thing to me. And, and so let's just talk about like Ethan Smith, 
and sure. some, some of the other influences that perhaps one could see him pulling from. So um, Joseph Smith lived in the very first um, uh, antiquities mania. So um, right at the time he was born, uh, Napoleon took an expedition to Egypt. And when the French took over Egypt, they um, dug everything up and they found all of these <laughs> artifacts. Um, you know, and so Egypt is the best place in the world to find buried stuff because it doesn't have any precipitation and the wa you know, water destroys everything. And so it's just desert right after, outside of where the Nile is. And so they dug all these things up, including the Rosetta Stone. And, uh, and so suddenly um, there became a mania for uh, lost antiquities and everybody across uh, Europe you know, actually could, was realizing they could dig everything up, <laughs> you know, uh, in their own backyards because they're all living on on areas of ancient civilization. And that, you know, in the United States settler culture was an extension of uh, uh, Europe, European culture. And so that same kind of in interests were, you know, so Thomas Jefferson conducted um, archaeological, you know, this is more or less grave robbing at this point. But anyway, what became archaeology um, uh, digs of Indian mounds uh, in order to kind of write up, you know, findings. And, um, and the reality is, is that, uh, so there was just giant earthworks everywhere from uh, medieval and ancient um, Indian civilizations that uh, had been much widespread across the middle um, middle west of the United States and, and even up into upstate New York and so forth. Um, uh, and so people were just impressed with the earthworks, but they were continuously disappointed that they weren't finding, um, you know, the kind of thing they're not finding Egyptian, <laughs> you know, you know, gold uh, King Tut hats and everything like that. In other words, they're not finding they're not finding stones that have big inscriptions on it and things like that. And so they wanted those things, and so some people found them and and so on. Uh, but when they found them, those are things that they put there themselves usually in terms of the settlers. And so and so it was definitely a context of what what people wanted at the time. So there was also lots of speculation um, from settler culture. So uh, as I mentioned, we've talking, been talking about this biblical worldview, the, um, the knowledge that we now have of, of human history, that humanity's history, that civilization goes back so much further before the Bible was written or any of the stories of Adam and Eve and, and so on, which are all not historical, but are mythical. And we can tell when they were introduced based on archaeology, literary criticism, the Bible, and so forth. Um, that was not known. So those were read literally. They were understood to be <clears throat> real people. People were doing the kind of Bishop Usher style calculations to decide how many thousand years old the world was and so on. And they also believed, for example, that the flood described in Genesis uh, with Noah was a universal flood. And so they wanted to, based on that, they wondered to themselves, okay, well, where did these Indians come from, <laughs> you know, and uh, why are all the animals and so on come from? And so there was all kinds of um, armchair theories. And one of them is, as you mentioned, is a guy named Ethan Smith, who is uh, um, uh, a pastor, but also, you know, uh, in, in, I think, Oliver Cowdery's congregation, right, and, uh, and so on in Vermont, and uh, publishes a book called View of the Hebrews, where he uses um, what's actually a common, still apologetic technique of parallelism, where you're saying, um, boy, isn't it interesting that people have pyramids that are shaped like that in his place and in like this place, and isn't it interesting that um, uh, natives wash their hands in this way, and and so do Jewish people. <laughs> and isn't it? You know, in other words, so they make a bunch of columns like that, and and then that, and and then based on that kind of parallelism, uh, can yourself to your satisfaction that well, what it must mean is that the um, uh, uh, the, the natives are actually descended of the lost ten tribes. And so that was certainly one of the theories that was out there. Um, it's though not uh, convincing when you when apologists say, well, that's not the story that Joseph Smith tells in the Book of Mormon, uh, because there's multiple different theories about, you know, whether where these could come out. I mean, the, the point of the question is, how do you get from a biblical worldview? How do you get from a flood and the people, all the people that survive come off Noah's Ark? How do you get from there to having Indians? And so and so and so actually the Book of Mormon tells two um, two different theories 
and neither of which is like you say the last 10 tribes marched there that was what that would have been another story you could have told uh, but it tells essentially some refugees from the destruction of right actually escaping the destruction of jerusalem by the babylonians a small family a couple families of refugees and it also tells people who made a mass migration after after the ark story right after the tower of babel when people first uh, had different languages they get on a bunch of boats and they they're the ones that bring the animals and so anyway so the, so there's two different stories solomon spaulding you know writes one where the people are i think refugees they're like romans that got um shipwrecked and so forth so so it's just a matter of how do you get people within the biblical worldview from post-flood events to repopulate the americas and um and so, so I don't, I don't think that that apologetic, you know, that, you, that they're not specifically a story of the lost 10 tribes, you know, escaping from the Assyrians and marching all the way across the Bering Strait or whatever and coming to North America. I don't think that that's not a very convincing argument to me. Um, so basically, you know, and I'm very fascinated by this period of time. And of course, I can't wait for the next couple of segments we're going to do because I'm actually excited about all of them. But, um, <laughs> you know, this, I, I the Book of Mormon is a very interesting document, and and I want to talk just a little bit about, um, for instance, my friend Jonathan Neville uh, wrote this book called Infinite Goodness, uh, Joseph Smith, Jonathan Edwards, and the Book of Mormon, and oh, makes yeah. a pretty compelling case that um, the sermons and the ideas of Jonathan Edwards made their way into the Book of Mormon. Now, this is, Jonathan is a faithful Orthodox Mormon. He's a okay, believer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, but he he sees uh, he did a Google search uh, he, of phrases and stuff that were not in the Bible, yeah, but were that were unique and kept on coming back to Jonathan Edwards. Uh, yeah. So he's he's kind of saying now he's looking at Joseph Smith as being a translator, not somebody who's reading off a stone. Um, and this is the this is the most interesting thing is when we talk about the translation process of the Book of Mormon, the Church um, basically. Well, many of the scholars want us to say believe that he was looking in a hat and words were appearing on the seer stone they used for the treasure digging, and that's how he was just just dictating things. Whereas others would say that he was he he was he was an active participant in the translation process, um, yeah. and and I tend to think that Jonathan's position is more I think more naturalistic and more grounded in reality than a stone that has words appear on it. This is speaking yeah, as yeah, an yeah. outsider. Yeah. Um, and so maybe just talk a little bit about how you think the process of producing the Book of Mormon, um, you know, you don't have, I mean, we don't know exactly how he did it, but give me yeah, a general yeah. idea of what you think happened there. So, um, so I would say that it's uh, like putting, putting yourself like in like a mindset of where you are attempting to um, like, channel the words it's not something that I, I there's not something that is um like it's certainly not seeing on a stone because this is again anything that what you've been seeing is on your spiritual eyes anyway um but i would say it's like um uh <clears throat> you know it, it may continue like the spiritualist analogy if there was a um you know in, there were committed spiritualists who would have believed that they were channeling uh you know the the spirit of Amen, Nefri, you know, so so on, so on forth, an Egyptian, you know, who was this and that, and and that that per and when as as they're doing that, they they'll speak in what the spirit is saying, right? And so, um, and so I would think that there was more like that than some kind of a mechanistic process that people would like to have it described. I think that that's coming from like a description from David Whitmer, who may well have just that may just be how he understood it would have happened and he wasn't actually experiencing it and so forth right and so um and so in any event he was wondering he always maybe wondered how it was happening and that's how he figured it out in his own head and, and then later told everybody twenty thousand times because he was the one witness who told everybody about it you know what i mean so that doesn't that's not he never experienced it so i'd say it's much more akin to um that kind of spiritual channeling which is still um consonant with the possibility you know in other words that joseph smith um actually believes he's channeling an actual text, you know, and so, um, you know, he may understand as all uh, folk practitioners do, uh, the amount of which uh, some of the things that he's doing uh, certainly are, are more theatrical in order to understand for his audience to understand it and under, you know, because they, they're not as, as insiders, you know, that's what magic works, you know. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, as I've said before, you know, people say, oh, he, he's just a con artist or something like that. 
actually folk practitioners are generally speaking believe in magic you know if they're practitioners of magic and all i in a certain in a sense it shouldn't be controversial for us to say that a folk practitioner isn't themselves superstitious as we might call it um it, i think that there's anyway quite good enough reason to think that he believes in his own gift and uh and this also um could extend to his understanding of this record as as channeling an actual the actual story that's been lost so he knows that there is um, that he does not have in his possession the physical plates artifact. So whether or not he believes that there are actual real physical golden plates that remain buried, he knows that they are not in his possession. So when he has a box or when he when people say they're under uh, um, I think if anything, anything that that would be is a prop. That's not, and he, Joseph Smith knows that those are not, there's no golden plates there. Um, but uh, but in, in that sense, those are him acting in such a way that people around him, his audience needs to have the sense of something physical and real in order to um, believe what he's telling them about what is potentially what he thinks is a true record. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so, yeah, I just wanna remind folks, you know, I, I did the review of the last 116 pages book with Don Bradley and he had a two-parter uh, conversation with Don and gives a very fascinating story about the lost book of Lehi yeah. Um, stories that made their way into the, the that we can reconstruct some of the stories. So we want to talk, you know, because we're talking this period of time, we're only giving it an hour, hour and a half for each period, so we can't cover everything. Yeah. But uh, but I think that that's an interesting story to talk about. And and then uh, of course there's things like the Mosiah priority and all these things that are really fascinating about Book of Mormon scholarship. I I mean I guess you know, uh, John, I th I think one of the things that it's it's a remarkable, in, in and of itself, whether it was a supernatural or a naturalistic thing, it's a pretty remarkable book, and it's a pretty audacious thing that comes to the world and announces itself as a, another form of scripture. What did Von Brody said? He, he had the audacity to start a religion in the era of the printing press, you know, and use that same printing <laughs> press that produces scripture. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, we just talk about this, the audacity of the Book of Mormon. Um. Yeah, well, I guess it's, I don't know, I guess it's audacious. It's not the only, it's not the only thing. In other words, I I, I do like to um, remind people, I mean, it, it seems, this story seems so unique and different, but there's not that there are not um, other prophets or other, you know, for example, religions that are contemporaneously, I mean, the Baha'i are are not that much different in time period and and the volumes of scripture that those guys ended up with yeah. are, are way too much you know it's way that's that's actually their problem now as far as i'm concerned is that they have those guys talk too much <laughs> anyway but the um uh so it's not it's not impossibly audacious or or unique in that way but it is a it is certainly a um for someone in joseph smith's circumstances to have decided to do it and actually to have um produced the the, the it's a significant length of work um at a certain point you, you get the impression from it that even though the the conceit of it is that the um it's being written on plates that are so precious and tiny that you have to just make it you know very powerful every single every single first verse um the bible is so much more economical than the book of mormon you know if you were if genesis is like the most economical book that exists you can't even believe how how few verses the tower of babel story is you know what i mean it, there's nothing you know what i mean you everything else is you know like the eden story everything is is such a um you know, like we we think of those things as being almost like an hour-long movie but but it, but in fact it's a few verses you know and and it's because um uh this very economical source genesis has been expanded in terms of all of western thought ever since at least ever since constantine and so forth you know it's, it's dominated western thought um the book of mormon kind of reads and occasionally like a guy who's like having trouble filling out the the length that he's trying to get to for his editor you know and so it does you know it does get a little rambly um it, it's um uh, uh sometimes like the speeches or whatever get kind of long and then they end up circling back in ways that have been identified or misidentified as like chi chiasmus and stuff like that uh instead is i think a sign of oral dictation oral composition as a person who is doing kind of a um a spoken composition uh circles back around to the points that they were making and so forth um, but it is a, you know, just with those provisos, it's a remarkable book. And it's actually remarkable for um, evangelicals in terms of um, encapsulating and recording um, 
second great awakening sermons that could have been preached from a revival pulpit preached again extemporaneously in other words orally composed they were not they were not pre-composed by notes and so therefore they're entirely lost the preacher had his bible in front of him like the book of mormon author also does uh, and then and then preaches from that text often and so and so and in this case though he's preaching at a slow enough pace and he's got a scribe there who's actually recording it down and so it's almost as if we had a, a dictaphone for some of these revivals and so it is an Im impressively and it's an important artifact for um even evangelicals for understanding what revival preaching would be because we don't have too many of those um and so uh and so, and, and so there's all kinds of, and there's all kinds of just episodes that are very memorable. Um, uh, like you say, the, uh, there's turns of phrase. Um, whenever I'm, I'm I, I, we teach, a, I'm, I'm one of the leaders of a, of a Book of Mormon uh, discussion group in my congregation every Saturday. Uh, and so um, whenever I'm preparing like a lesson and we're going to have a discussion, we've been talking about how the Book of Mormon's perspective on the atonement, like for the last couple of weeks, before that we had Book of Mormon's Christology, before that we had Book of Mormon on, on the Trinity and so on. In other words, we've been going through topics like that, you know, and whenever I do that and I come across Book of Mormon phrase, I'm like, that is such a... Um, that's such a poetic phrase. And so then I always have to, I get out my uh, Bible search for the King James Bible and I type in that phrase to see, okay, is that biblical? And I'm just not remembering, you know, cause I haven't read Micah recently enough or whatever Isaiah, you know? And so sometimes it's that, but sometimes like your, um, your, your friend here is, who's, uh, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot. Jonathan Who, uh, Neville, Jonathan Neville. Yeah, his, his study of, that it's from Jonathan Edwards, right? So in other words, some of, in some cases, it may well be a phrase that is common in the milieu. And maybe there's things that are also just fairly original, you know, uh, into the Book of Mormon. But, um, but there's a lot of um, ways things that are formulated that are very striking and interesting and i'm and i'm always i'm always struck by that anew like i say right now because i'm doing i'm doing this class and so um so you explore and you yeah it um i often don't agree with the book of mormon <laughs> you know so so the book of mormon uh often has uh, you know like you know it might often will have like a doctrine or suggest doctrines of atonement or or things like that you know uh uh it suggests so for example it suggests air you know a um absolution to the problem of evil which is there must needs be opposition in all things you know what i mean in other words god created evil because otherwise there can't be good and you know i'm i'm very much uh uh less excited about that as a solution to the problem of evil than i am of of saint augustine's view which is that uh that evil is not evil is not black and good is not white but rather good is light and evil is simply absence of light so darkness is not a thing; it is simply absence of thing, and so and so uh, and so that's a different perspective entirely than there must needs be opposition in all things. But anyway, you know, um, I also understand the the need for that because you know you think of that in terms of free will and so forth. So it is it's engaging uh, in dialogue, and so the way we approach it in my church anyway is um, we and we do this with all scripture. Uh, we listen to what the uh, ancient or modern prophet or apostle or whoever is writing has to say, and then uh, we think of that as a uh, as a theological proposition, and then we and then we react to that. In other words, so we are in conversation and dialogue with the with the scripture. You know, and just uh, talk a little bit. This uh, visions in the seer stone uh, by William Davis it talks yeah. about how the influence of uh, you know of the sermons may have had on the process. Um, Bill, I'm going to get this thing read and we're going to have you on, uh, <laughs> but we've both been swamped. So we haven't been able to schedule anything, but um, you know, um, and I actually got to sit in one of those Saturday morning conferences that you had and I loved it. And unfortunately I'm always doing yard work when you're doing that. So I never can, <laughs> want to come in there all dirty and sweaty and like, Hey, you know, but it's, that's always my landscaping day. <laughs> but um, you know, so I, um, you know, one of the most interesting things about the Book of Mormon that makes it unique is that it's the, it's the, it's a book that predates the religion that it starts, right? right. So usually you have the religion, then you have the scripture. This yeah. is the opposite. So maybe just talk about the uniqueness of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon before there's even a Church of Christ. Yeah. Well, so yeah, there isn't, a, I don't think that there's a sense at all at first that, that, um, that the Book of Mormon want to lead to a church but 
as they um, as we get into that process and the Book of Mormon composition, the Book of Mormon is uh, is autobiographical itself for during the time period of the composition process. And Dan Vogel has shown that pretty extensively in the making of a prophet, his um, award-winning biography of this in the process and so forth. But um, what I'd say is that, um, so this is where this mosaic and um, priority is very important. So for me, I always read the Book of Mormon starting with Mosiah first. Oh. So, so for me, um, I feel like you can't understand it. You can't understand the development of its thought if you start at the be at what is now the beginning, or what's meant to, was originally meant to be the beginning. But anyway, was the part that's written last, because um, because the thought develops beginning at the beginning of Mosiah, which is where the 116 pages, so called or whatever you know uh, that you've talked about with Don Bradley, when that is gone. And so now it picks up just in mid sentence, <laughs> you know, hoping to get the 116 pages back and then goes through Mosiah to the end and then starting over with the small plates of Nephi, as they were called, and going to the end of, of Words of Mormon and so forth. So if you do that, if you're really worrying about the atonement or something like that, you start in the Mosiah, then you can kind of see what the thinking is at first, and then you can follow it all the way through till around to the end when the, the, the end development. And so at the beginning, so for example, in terms of wanting to have a church, you know, at the beginning, um, they're at a revival, the Nephites and, and, uh, and Mulekites, and uh, King Benjamin is telling them all this stuff and, and telling them more or less that they need to be born again, and they get born again through a revival experience, and they do not need um, a church for that, and they do not need um, sacraments or ordinances like baptism. So there is no, King Mosiah does not say, oh, you must be baptized or something. Sorry, King Benjamin is not saying you must be baptized. There is no baptism yet. <laughs> so, so it only then comes and it develops uh, that they're going to have a church when, in, when um, in, in opposition to the priestcraft and the story of the evil church that is led by um, uh, wicked King Noah, when when he, and he has his evil priests when the one one priest you know hears the again has a born again experience because he's hear, heard the preaching of abinadi when that guy goes off into you know with the refugees off into the wilderness to the waters of mormon uh alma the elder then he suddenly that's um he has he suddenly has a need and a revelation need for baptism and for founding a church and he's the one that does it so it's only in alma that that happens and so alma the elder um, has a um, experience about how how you could have authority to have a baptism which is you pray to the spirit the spirit descends on you he self-baptizes and he bap and starts baptizing everybody else this is also how contemporaneously when that part of the story is being composed and now they're starting a church in the book of mormon now suddenly Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery are thinking of the need to do this themselves. They pray, uh, there's no visitation by John the Baptist or anything like that, this later story that's developed and, and now they make statues of it as if, as if that happened. <laughs> Instead, what will have happened is that the spirit descends on them, they baptize each other, and that's the beginning of, of baptism in the restoration tradition, just like it's in the Alma story. And then they found a church, and it's at that point, from then point on, that, uh, that um, that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery are thinking about founding a church, you know, and so it's only then by the time they, and then by the time they get to, you know, the end of the regular part of the book, and then they add on the book of Ether and the book of Moroni, the book of Moroni is almost like a, a frequently asked questions, you know, for if so, you think you're going to found a church, you need to do this, 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 and this. In other words, it's already answering kind of the questions because they're, they're anticipating that they're going to have a church. You know, and so and so, and then they go through and they do the end and the beginning part last. But any in any event, so I think the idea of having a church comes out of the Book of Mormon. So I think the beginning of the Book of Mormon doesn't betray any idea that the, the Nephites they don't even have a church uh, when and, and at first, and it's only at a certain point that they develop the idea that they have a need for that, and that they and that for example, baptism is going to be a part of that. That wasn't a part of it initially. I, it's fascinating just to hear this perspective and everything. And again, folks, uh, this channel is not out to show where you're wrong or, you know, or I'm trying to say that I got all the answers that I don't. Um, yeah, yeah. And for those of you where the Book of Mormon functions as scripture, I do not have a problem with that at all. Um, I think that if scripture can inform us in so many ways. Um, I'm, I gave a presentation about my encountering with the Book of Mormon that I post, posted on my channel to a group that actually John also has addressed as well. 
And I think it's just important that we have this dialogue. The part of this, the purpose of this channel is to have these conversations. And one of the things that I love about the Book of Mormon and um, is that it is full of a lot of things that are familiar to me. As somebody who comes from a charismatic, born again experience tradition, the book speaks to me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and so to me, I find it to be kind of an awesome book. And, yeah. uh, and, and so, uh, and I just want to talk like, for instance, Christopher Thomas, who wrote A Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon, right? Yeah. He's finding, doc I mean, a lot of people don't see, so Christopher has six degrees, including one from Princeton. He's one of the top Pentecostal theologians in the world. And he did a textual analysis of the Book of Mormon and found phrases and doctrines that are unique to 1906 Azusa Street Revival that make their way into like the Assemblies of God and Church of God and four square yep, yep, churches. Yep, yep. The Book of Mormon has the phraseology, has the fivefold gospel, has a lot of the doctrines that would later become uh, key doctrines in the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. And the Book of Mormon already has those concepts and ideas and even the particular phraseology there. I mean, that's pretty amazing to me. Yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. Um, it's definitely at the root of the same tradition. And in fact, actually, the, um, the some of these early practices, early uh, Latter-day Saint practices, not even called Latter-day Saints yet, but anyway, these early restoration practices of, um, for example, laying on of hands and things like that, that, um, that was less common um, in kind of most any Christianity before. It wasn't something that they invented, but anyway, that it was emerging in that same milieu, and it's that same um, it's that same root and thread that can is going to get you to, uh, you know, like you say that um, that particular strand that goes that takes off and becomes Pentecostalism and so forth. Um, but there is a it, but that doesn't it, it's all caught up in the same root, and it's happening right then because it doesn't it doesn't extend a lot before this, you know, that where the, where the people have had those kind of things. And so yeah, it's an interesting. Um, it's like an interesting way, uh, like if you're looking at it as an artifact, it's an interesting place to kind of encapsulate the, um, like the proto material that is going to later inspire, um, you know, full on Pentecostalism when, when that, when those ideas get more fully baked. It's the same way that um, Joseph Smith's folk magic, it's not full on wearing a turban, crystal balls and having a Ouija board and things like that. That stuff develops later, but it's out of these roots that are developing here in the early 19th century, you know, where they, where they are doing some of these things, you know, um, and to, and to your other point about, um, uh, you know, when you'd have a, um, a, a, the religious book that comes before the movement is even thought of, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that ends up being very unique is um, uh, you even it, the problem with the book is where it comes from that it can't be very readily accepted by Pentecostals and so forth and uh, and so on and so forth. But in terms of if you're just reading it because that you know uh, if it if it, if nobody had seen it before and it fell out of the sky uh, and a copy of it you know landed in. I don't know where Tennessee and another copy landed in Salt Lake. <laughs> Nobody in Salt Lake would accept this thing because it doesn't have any Mormon doctrine in it. You know, whereas everybody, everybody, I mean, it'd be perfectly fine for, um, you know, like a Pentecostal preacher who got a hold of it. He'd be like, "This is great," you know. <laughs> so <laughs> that's so true. Yeah, I know, and and that's one of the things I spoke at a Book of Mormon rally this fall. And I listed all the things that I loved about the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the Protestant doctrines and Pentecostal and charismatic yeah. things. And, and, and I believe in believer's baptism. So is the Book of Mormon. All right. There's, yeah. you know, yeah. and, I, and I talk about just all the doctrines. And then I, I was, Casey Griffiths from BYU was sitting in the front row. And I looked at, because he spoke at the rally as well. And I said, in Casey, one of, and another reason I like the Book of Mormon so much is there's very little Mormonism in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> And I said, now, folks, I say this in well, love, of course. I'll tell you that in the, in the RLDS church, one of the reasons we love the Book of Mormon so much is that it, it has the most um, blatant condemnation of polygamy. You know, I mean, the, the Bible is quite ambiguous, but the Book yeah. of Mormon is like, this is this is an abomination, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> Exactly. I know. A, you know. And I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you, you, of course, you're, when you say RLDS, that was the original name of your church, which is now the community. Well, the original name of my church was Church of church, Christ. Church of Christ. <laughs> when we were organized on April 6th, 1830. But and we then, gone through course, several subsequent na name changes, and one of them was the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Spot on. That's right. That's right. Because, you know, I always tell people, I say, you know, there isn't just one church that Joseph Smith founded or right. one group that claims him as their founder. 
Um, my favorite, uh, my favorite is the Church of Jesus Christ. Them, them's my people, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. right? And yeah, uh, they are great. And you've attended services. Well, by the way, my favorite is the Stragites. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I the love it. I go to um, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, Strangite in Boree. Um, the, they're just the best people. Uh, I just love, uh, we, we, whenever we can go there, you know, they always... Uh, let us stay with them and we hang out and they have full access to all the archives and have gone and done so much research there and they're so nice and mike plays the piano for their service and uh, you know i'm i participate in their their uh gospel doctrine class it's not called that but anyway that you, know, <laughs> you know essentially that kind of a thing so it's wonderful to go hang out with them oh yeah well yeah you know, okay, that's <laughs> that's great that's really awesome and that's what i like about you too is that you know we, we last time we were talking how you know i can name a handful of people that know as much about me that know more than I do about the different sects within the restoration. Of course, I mentioned you and I mentioned uh, Steve Shields. And then you brought up a, a gentleman, Mr. Uh, goes yeah, last Jason. name Smith. Yeah. And I got in contact with him and said, hey, listen, dude, I want to have you on because you're yeah. an evangelical who knows a lot of this stuff. And I, I, I yeah. find these conversations interesting. So this is the book. Roger Lonius wrote this, Joseph Smith III, yes. Pragmatic Prophet. And I had Roger on as a guest. So check out that interview. And of course, I did a book review of this as well. I also uh, just want to point out that uh, one of the things, and maybe we'll talk about this maybe in one of our next episode, uh, <laughs> is that you also do, uh, this is from the John Whitmer Journal, and yeah. uh, excuse the green screen, folks, as best I can do. Um, <laughs> this, you actually uh, illustrated this, so maybe tell me a little bit about this uh, illustration you did. Yeah, so I, um, I made the, I've been making the front covers Anyway, my majority of the journals now, in the course of the run of the of the John Whitmer Historical Association Journal, I've done the covers for them, wow. and I actually I've done um, dozens. Of, anyway, I don't know how many, but anyway, covers for all kinds of restoration uh, tradition books and so forth. Um, so cover design and publishing—that's one of my backgrounds. Um, when I was a kid, I was the like the the artist for the you know high school newspaper and so on, and I had an art. Um, scholarship when going to college and so forth. Anyway, so the art is one of my backgrounds in advertising and that kind of a thing. And so I like to do it. I love publishing and I love making books. Um, and so that particular cover was a fun one. Um, uh, Susan Staker, uh, who uh, has a, um, a, a really nice um, article on kind of, you know, the kind of the secrets culture of Nauvoo and, and how so much stuff was going on clandestinely and, and how that affected uh, Mormon culture and so forth. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, and so anyway, I, I, so that made me think of that. And so I, I, I drew kind of a, a, a picture of Nauvoo at nighttime with, uh, people kind of secretly courting, you know, going around lantern by anyways. And, uh, and, and Emma's in the, in the uh, mansion house at, staring out the window at Joseph as he's courting some, some lady <laughs> so yeah it's, so it, it's taken with a little i mean i mean i don't i don't i more than want to take it flippantly there's some there's some very bad abuses going on you know and and the, and the article is quite serious but i i i thought it um i thought it was anyway it was an appropriate cover for to to have the topic <laughs> and of course you were the previous president of the john whitmer historical association so you have a deep well, long time ago long time ago right <laughs> not the previous one not yeah, previous so I, like yeah that. Yeah. And, and so you have, and of course, everybody watch my interview with John that I shot last summer, uh, gives you some really good, interesting information about John that hasn't really been talked about in other places. Um, John, uh, you are a pastor at a, uh, a historic congregation in downtown Detroit. Um, I, just, I just wanted to just talk briefly about the church that you have and how unique it is within the restoration, because not only is it a a, a good solid local congregation but it actually has a, a worldwide outreach yeah um so yeah the I'm, I'm right here actually in the in the congregation uh church so we are in downtown toronto we are actually um this is a um a ground floor uh commercial condominium that the church owns uh in a multi-use tower so there are other commercial properties around the on the on the streets and then there's all the condos where people live above it and parking garages below and so forth um, and so it's right in one of the towers downtown and uh, it's two blocks away from uh, we're in a neighborhood called old town so the oldest part of the town of toronto and we're two blocks away from uh where um the very first pastor of the congregation john taylor and his wife lived uh and they um were held they held cottage meetings just like i say two blocks away 
uh, and Joseph Smith came here and uh, and preached to the congregation and to the residents and things like that. Uh, there was important early conferences that are had here. Obviously, John Taylor eventually. One of the things that always happen in all the branches is uh, when there's a um, there's a sense of gathering, right? And so when um, and so important leaders from this area like John Taylor and William Law. Um, left and went and went to Nauvoo and so forth. And John Taylor eventually became an apostle. And then from the perspective of our church, he left the church to join Brigham Young's church. And he ultimately uh, became the leader of Brigham Young's church when Brigham Young uh, died. And so, um, and William Law uh, obviously founded a reform Mormon church and um, was, had the newspaper that got destroyed and so forth. And so he, um, you know, was also, thought of as, a, as kind of in our tradition as being kind of a hero of standing up for uh, for truth when there was a lot of abuses that were happening. And so even in the face of when you uh, have to sometimes speak against the church leader when when those kind of abuses are happening. And so those are kind of a couple of early leaders that came out of the Toronto congregation. Uh, what often happens is that the congregations, um, you know, the, the leaders gather and so then they stop meeting and so on. But there was a continuity of of old saints who continued to be here in Toronto. Um, and so in the 1860s, uh, when new missionaries came through from the reorganization, the branch was reorganized. Uh, one of the old time members that was still here had been actually a clerk in Nauvoo under William Law, and he still remembered all of that. Um, and one of the, there was an old, old doctor who had actually remembered Joseph Smith preaching here and so on. Um, and that uh, the reorganized uh, branch in the 1860s lasted for a while, but its leader, Joseph Luff, was also um, a very uh, energetic leader. So he was called to be an apostle and he moved to independence and in the, with the reorganized church and so forth. And that caused us to you know, lose control of our building. We couldn't pay the, the mortgage. And so anyway, so we kind of deorganized again. But anyway, uh, reorganized again in, in 1891. And there was an amazingly charismatic leader named R.C. Evans who reorganized the branch and has been in continuous organization since 1891. Um, R.C. Evans is perhaps the most uh, gifted orator in the entire restoration tradition, certainly is the most in community of Christ in the reorganization. But I think he probably... Uh, would have given anybody out of Utah a run for their money. Um, we had as our part of our um, ministry here, uh, we would rent out all of the big uh, theaters in Toronto, Massey Hall, which is just over here, a couple blocks. And uh, it filled 7,000 people would fill it up on a Sunday uh, uh, in the theater ministry that was happening. Um, ultimately, R.C. Evans, he became a member of the RLDS uh, First Presidency, and he definitely uh, had a huge ego. He believed that Joseph Smith III was going to name him to be the successor. Uh, when that didn't happen, and Joseph Smith instead named his son, Frederick Madison Smith, to be the successor, that made R.C. Evans kind of disgruntled. Uh, they created a position for him, which essentially made him head of the church in Canada. <laughs> um, but then he was so disgruntled all the time that uh, eventually, eventually there was a, a showdown between him and Fred M., and, and he got kicked out of the church. He founded his own church here in Toronto, and then he died of the uh, the Spanish flu in uh, plague, uh, you know, the last one of these pandemics that happened. And so then their church kind of limped, his church kind of limped along for another 20 or 30 years or whatever. The congregation here regrouped. And uh, we've been going um, really good since. We've been a leading congregation more or less of the time. We have had the trouble of all kind of urban congregations that people have had in North America where everybody moves to the suburbs and so on. So we declined down to pretty small numbers um, as of the early 21st century, um, when we sold our old building, ultimately uh, had a discernment process, moved here, kind of renewed ourselves in different ways. And as you say now, one of the things that's happened is we have a, um, uh, a, a very substantial online ministry where, um, where we are at this point, uh, the, the, certainly the largest um, online ministry in the community of Christ with uh, um, people from all around the world joining us every every Sunday. Um, it's just kind of been amazing the growth that's happened uh, in the last couple of years. So yeah, it's a pretty remarkable story, John. And uh, you know we're going to be talking about. Um, so now our next episode takes place after the founding of the church. Now I think uh, what I what I think is going to be interesting about this period coming up is we're going to be talking about Sidney Rigdon, and we're going to yeah. be talking about. Um, the other restorationist branches within the evangelical uh, context as well, and Protestantism in general. And so we can, we're, that, that's going to be a very interesting conversation. 
and uh, and then um, I'm very much looking forward to that. And so, folks, we're gonna we're gonna do a part two. We're gonna film that. I don't know exactly when that one will air, and then we'll do the the period from 1844 to 1860 as well. I'm very excited about each one of these airs because I think they're just unique and interesting in their own way. I couldn't cover everything, but I just want to give a general overview where John and I could have these conversations. And uh, and 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 just real quick, John, is there anything in this period that we covered that you feel like we need you want to talk about or address or did we skip over anything that you think is important that we talk about um no i think this has been a, just a delightful conversation and i really appreciate the perspective that you bring to this always because um you know i'll have these conversations um you know with people in one of the traditions or others generally speaking um uh lds utah mormons or ex-mormons you know uh out of that tradition who have you know very particular things that they like to kind of laser focus on that are related to the apologetics and so um and and i think that often when we do that we it's i, I like it when we can pull back and just hear the think about the story in a different context and you always bring a fresh perspective to that which i think is so um uh, so appreciated and so relevant to the audience that you have here. And so, so no, I, I think it, I think it was a great conversation and I, I we, I look forward to the next, to the next, uh, episodes. Well, thanks dude, man. I'll tell you, every time you say something nice about me, I just, I think it's the most awesome thing in the world. <laughs> so I appreciate <laughs> it, man. You're, you're, you've been a real blessing to me too, but man, and I hope one day to get out there to Toronto and visit that congregation of yours. Uh, so I folks, I want, I want to thank you so much, first of all, John, for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very, I'm so happy you had me. Oh, great. And then uh, I just want to remind my audience to make sure you like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the notification button to be informed when a new episode comes out. We are now on all the most of the major podcast formats. So you can download the audio on Apple and iTunes and, uh, and Google and whatever else. Uh, <laughs> we're still a little backlogged on that. So I don't know when this one will be available in podcast, but Anthony and I are working on getting that all uh, taken as well. Don't forget, we have a Patreon page. So those of you who would like to support what I'm doing, we do in denominations of five, 10 and $15 a month. And I would, I do greatly appreciate the people who are supporting me. Um, and Mormon book reviews at gmail.com if you wish to get a hold of me. So thanks again, everybody. You have yourself a great day. Thanks again. <laughs>